Catastrophizing is a cognitive distortion that involves assuming the worst possible outcome is the most likely scenario. Is catastrophizing what has kept humanity alive all this time? And furthermore, if we stopped doing it, would we all die? First, we need to understand what catastrophizing is and why so many of us deal with it. Our nervous system is wired to seek out any threat in our environment. Now that threat can be physical or emotional. And whether we realize it or not, we are looking around our space to make sure that we're safe and okay in it. If something seems off, like let's say we see a creepy guy in an alleyway, we're gonna stay away from that area or maybe even run from it. This all happens without much conscious thought. Our brain assesses a situation, identifies a possible threat, and chooses between fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, otherwise known as our stress response. But what happens when our stress response is overactive and thinks almost everything is a threat? And why does this happen? Like I've shared in the past, when we have a big reaction to something small or what we often call an overreaction, that's a sign that there is more to this, meaning that this reaction is telling us there's something bigger that's attached to this experience. It's not really about the current situation at all. Our brain is connecting it to something else that feels much more intense to us. Whatever it is, it triggers a larger response than the current situation warrants. And we overreact, or for many of us, we catastrophize. We can start to play out only the worst case scenario, jump to conclusions about ourselves and what this experience could do or mean. If we let this go unchecked and continue to engage in it, research actually proves that it causes us more pain and suffering. In an article by Laura Petrini and Lars Arndt Nielsen from the Center for Neuroplasticity and Pain, they cite various studies showing that not only does catastrophizing lead to higher levels of pain and suffering, but also an increased need for medical advice, greater healthcare utilization, increased disability, and worse outcomes after surgery which is another reason why we all need access to affordable health care and mental health care. And if you're in the States and you haven't enrolled in a health care plan, go to healthcare.gov and enroll now. If you find yourself in crisis or you're needing extra support, you can also call the crisis response line at 988. And this video comes to you as part of the Better Internet Initiative, supported by the Fellow Americans Education Fund. The trouble with research is that no one really agrees on what catastrophizing is. Each area, be it pain management, anxiety treatments, or depression rating scales, all define it differently or exclude portions that the other researchers deem to be the most important. Honestly, reading through all of this and seeing all of the disagreement made my head spin. To try and synthesize all of the definitions out there about catastrophizing and to make it as inclusive as possible, I found a wonderful article by Dr. Ashley Cox called It's All in Your Head, Managing Catastrophizing Before It Becomes a Catastrophe. And she found that catastrophizing is made up of three dimensions. Helplessness, it's awful and the feeling overwhelms me. Rumination, I can't stop thinking about how much this hurts and magnification. I worry that something serious may happen. Keeping those three things in mind, I believe that we can figure out if we are actually catastrophizing and be able to find our way out of it. Let's start off with helplessness, the first dimension of Dr. Cox's list. Helplessness is a painful dimension of catastrophizing, and I would be lying if I didn't tell you that seeing this on her list was shocking to me. I had never connected the two experiences, but after careful consideration, I think it's important that we do. Because if we don't think that we can do anything to help ourselves or our situation, then we are always going to consider the worst case scenario. Almost like we already know it's gonna be bad. We just have to take it. Helplessness doesn't motivate us. In fact, it does the complete opposite, which is why if we find ourselves constantly feeling like we're helpless in our life, it's very likely that we struggle with catastrophizing. The next dimension is rumination. 
And if you aren't familiar with that term, to ruminate on something is to think about it really carefully and for a long time. I would even go as far as to say that when we are ruminating, we can't stop thinking about something even if we fight to do that. For many of my patients, they felt that in order to prepare for a potential bad thing, they had to think about it over and over and over again, often focusing on all of the ways that it could go wrong. And when I'd ask them about this, they would say that not thinking about it seemed scarier. That as long as they had considered the worst case, then they knew that they could survive anything. Rumination is interesting as a part of catastrophizing because I've always thought that rumination is linked directly to anxiety, that the uncontrollable worry that comes along with anxiety could also be considered rumination. So it got me thinking, is catastrophizing connected to anxiety? And I had to dig back into the research and as it turns out, it does. In an article by Sarah Berg published on the American Medical Association's website, she interviews psychiatrist Dr. Tom Zobler to help explain what catastrophic thoughts were and if they can be part of an anxiety disorder. And Dr. Zobler states, catastrophic thinking is a cognitive distortion that occurs when people have a hard time weighing the likelihood of certain outcomes and believe that terrible or catastrophic outcomes, which are highly unlikely, become in one's mind salient and extremely likely. Dr. Zabler explained, noting that it can lead to a lot of suffering, but it's not an uncommon problem. On some level, we all do that, he said. We've all had these experiences where we say something to a loved one or in a meeting and suddenly we think, is that the end of my job, my relationship, or whatever it may be? And that's just part of the human condition. It is, however, important to recognize when this type of thinking becomes persistent and interferes with one's life. Dr. Zabler added, noting that catastrophic thinking can be a symptom of an underlying problem with anxiety, which can be effectively treated with psychotherapy and in some cases, medication. It makes sense that if we can't stop thinking about how bad something is or could be, that it would lead us to feeling worse and being able to only see the ways in which things would go wrong. The third dimension Dr. Cox discussed in her research is magnification. Now this means that instead of seeing something for what it is, we consider it to be much larger than that. In other words, we turn a molehill into a mountain. And magnification is one of those cognitive distortions that I don't talk about enough but I've always loved the visuals that the word itself gives us. If we think about using a magnifying glass, that means that the thing that we're looking at is small and we need it enlarged. When we struggle with the symptom, we often can't see something in the size that it actually is. We can even think that other people's views are distorted, not ours, almost as if we have magnifying glasses stuck to our eyes at all times. And not to get too nerdy on you here, but I also love the term cognitive distortion because it so clearly describes what's going on here. Our brain or our cognitions are sending us distorted versions of what's going on in our life. It's like we're looking in one of those funhouse mirrors or through glasses that aren't our prescription. We see everything not as it actually is, which I think aptly describes magnification. To give you a better idea of how magnification can play out in our lives, let's say you give a presentation at work. It all goes well. You move through your slides, you make your important points, everyone seems pleased. Afterwards, your boss says, great job, but next time could you talk a little bit more about the fact that we surpassed our sales goals? That'd be great. You freak out. You can't stop worrying that you're gonna lose your job. You're sure your boss hates you thinks you did a terrible job on your presentation. You talk to everyone who was in that room, you ask them how they thought it went, tell them that you think your boss doesn't like you and you're gonna get fired. Without realizing it, we've turned a very small constructive comment into a huge ordeal that now involves multiple people in our office. This could also look like us taking one small situation or mishap and thinking that means our life is over. Like we're gonna get dumped, that person's gonna leave us, we're gonna have to move, etc. Which I think we would all agree easily links up with the way that catastrophizing works. Something happens, we assume it's a way bigger deal than it is, and we imagine the worst. 
After taking a look at the research and considering what catastrophizing really is, do we think it's kept humanity alive all this time? And if we stopped doing it, would we all die? What do you think? While our stress response or fight, flight, freeze, and fawn has kept us alive, I don't know if the same goes for catastrophizing. Sure, it may start out as a way of warning us or helping us see potential threats, but it's based out of fear and anxiety, not facts. And I think that makes things worse for us overall. It can make us feel worse, not believing that it can get better. It doesn't produce anything helpful. So if we stopped catastrophizing, I believe we would still be alive. And to be honest, we'd be much happier. Now the most recent re- If one or even all three of these dimensions related to you or felt like they're affecting you on a regular basis, what do we do about it? The most research-backed answer is cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. In a 2017 study on catastrophizing fibromyalgia patients, they found that by becoming more aware of their catastrophizing thoughts and reframing them, they were better able to manage their pain. An example would be that instead of thinking, I forgot to lock the door when I left the house this morning, I'm sure I did, and someone's definitely gonna break in while I'm gone, they're gonna steal all my belongings and maybe even harm my family. I'm such a failure for forgetting such a basic thing and now we're all in danger. Now, CBT would help us recognize, uh, hey, we're having a thought, and it would challenge it with a more balanced one. That's kind of how this works. We notice we have this distorted thought, and we challenge it with something like, I think I forgot to lock the door when I left. I'm going to call my husband or wife and ask them to check, or I can go back on my break and check on things. Chances are no one's even going to try the door before I get back. It's annoying, but... We all forget things from time to time. Now this obviously takes practice and we have to manage any anxiety that can come up for us when we push back against the urge to catastrophize. But with practice, it can get easier and easier. In another 2017 study, I know, I guess they were really busy that year, but they found that catastrophizing is linked to a deeply held false belief about ourselves and our environment. We often believe that our world isn't safe and we have to always be on alert to ensure we aren't caught off guard. This means that our catastrophic thoughts are actually our way of feeling a bit better and more prepared and often even soothed. So when we talk about how to better manage it, we're gonna have to find other ways to soothe ourselves. And this could mean we tend to our basic needs, things like eating regularly, taking our medication as prescribed, taking a shower, drinking water, sleeping, things like that. In an effort to build up our resilience, that way, we're not going to get pushed off course or back into those unhelpful thoughts as easily. Next, we can try out some tools and techniques to help get that nervous, hypervigilant energy out of our system. We could stomp our feet, take a cold shower, or just dunk our face in cold water. We can go for a walk, shake it out, maybe do some deep breathing. If you have a tool or technique that helps you calm your nervous system down, feel free to leave it in the comments. You never know who you could help. I hope you found this interesting and helpful. Have a wonderful week and I will see you next time. But researcher doctor, doctor, thinking I forgot to lock, lock,